Jonah chapter number 1. Let's begin reading verse number 1. <clears throat> now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. That's where we're going to stop reading. Now, those of us been around church any bit of time, those that are studious of the Bible, you'll find that Jonah is referenced many places in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. You're going to find that everybody almost knew the story of Jonah. Okay, if you grew up around church, chances are you knew about Jonah when you was about, yay, tall. Right? Jonah, very popular story. The only thing that we don't know about Jonah is what Jonah was doing before the book of Jonah. After the book starts, we get a pretty detailed list of what's going on in Jonah's life. Now, what was Jonah doing before that? I don't know. Verse number one, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. I know who his dad was, but that's about it. What was he doing? I don't know. I believe he was a prophet. But I believe he was doing something for the Lord. Well, why do you say that? Well, where was Jonah? We don't know where Jonah was. But where do you need to be in order for God to actually give you something to do for him? You got to be busy about the Father's work. You got to be at the right place. I don't believe he is down hanging out at the bar that day. Right? I believe he was around the things of God. I believe he was where he was supposed to be at that moment. So I don't think it's too much of a stretch that we could say that Jonah, in verse number one, was exactly where God expected him to be and where God wanted him to be. Why is that? Because God spoke to him. Right? You find anybody that fell out of the will of God, what happened? God would send somebody to them. I mean, let's look at David. David, his great sin, we all know about David's great sin. Okay, although it is just as sinful as a little white lie. I don't know why people call it his great sin. It's just sin. Right? There is no big or little sin, it's just sin. Right? But David, who comes to it? The man of God comes. With a metaphor to him. Well, King, if a man were to take another man's sheep, right, and kill that man, what would he be guilty of? And eventually down the line we get to, Thou art the man. Right? David wasn't in position to receive word from the Lord, so what happened? God sent somebody to him. Well, Jonah's the one that God's sending. So what's that mean? Jonah had to be where God wanted him to be. Okay, that we did all that to say, I'm pretty sure that verse number one, Jonah was in the will of God. That's all that we're trying to get to. Okay, not a big conspiracy theory, but I think we can all agree in order for God to come to you and say, hey, I want you to go preach to that city over there, you've got to be living right. All right. Well, verse number two, what's he telling me? He says, arise, get up, and go. Where? To Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. Here we find God changing things for Jonah. Jonah, I know you're here, but get up and go over there. And when you get there, cry against the city. Or in other words, preach against all their wickedness. Okay, and then, not guaranteed to get this, but sometimes God does. He says, for their wickedness has come up before me. We not only get a where, we not only get a why, but we get a how. Right? Well, when? Now. He said, arise, go. Get up and go. Well, how do you want me to get there? Don't care, just go. Where? Nineveh. Why? Because their wickedness came up before God. Now, the Old Testament speak for their wickedness has gotten so wicked that God's fixing to wipe them off the map. In fact, when Jonah eventually gets there, he does declare, right, y'all got to get right or else God's going to destroy the city. And it said everybody from the king down to the poorest of the poor all got right with God. Arguably the greatest revival that we have documented evidence of. You say, why is that? Because 100% got in. There weren't any stragglers. All got right. Well, verse number two, he says, arise. What's that mean? 
He was fixing to stay there. Wherever Jonah was in verse number 1, I don't know, it says that he mentions his father, don't know if he's still hanging around where he was grown, you know, born, raised at. Don't know if he's just hanging out at the local temple, right, teaching, educating. But wherever he was, he had roots. As God said, arise. He wasn't ready to go. God had to tell him to get ready to go. So Jonah thought he was staying there for a while. But he wasn't packed up, ready to go. Boy, he just said, hey, Jonah, go down here. No, he said, arise. He was sitting, he was resting. Right? He was comfortable. Then he says, and after you get up, he's saying, I'm not just telling you to arise and do something here. Right? Anybody remember in class where a teacher would sometimes say, hey, you can go empty that garbage can. Right? Get up and empty the garbage can. Well, that's in the classroom. But every now and then they'd say, hey, can you get up and run down there? What's that? That's get up and go. You had to leave classroom. Well, Jonah's in his bubble and he's thinking that he's going to get to stay there. God didn't say arise and go teach this down at the temple. No, he said arise and go. I mean, I find it very similar to what God told Abram. He said, get you everything that you own and get out of your father's country. But he didn't tell him to take Lot with him, but he took Lot anyway. But he says, gather everything that's yours and go. Then you find that Abram lived a nomadic life. He never stopped going. He just kept looking. You know, the book of Hebrews tells us that he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for the city of God, and he wasn't going to stop until he found it. But here we got the opposite. We got Jonah who wanted to stay. He doesn't have a problem. Him. We've already... The word of the Lord came down to Jonah. Jonah, I want you to go preach down here. Well, Jonah decided, I like it here. I don't want to go. But if God wants me to go, I know I can't stay here no more. Right? Jonah was known in that area as the man of God. Well, people started asking around. Well, Jonah, how come you're not preaching anymore? Because well, God wants me to go down to Nineveh. You know what the people of God would have done? They'd have kicked them out of town. Or like, if, you, if you're not right with God, we don't want you around here. I mean, we're talking different dispensation. This is dispensation of law. But if somebody was known to be rebelling against God when Israel was living for God, guess what? They'd kick them out of town because they didn't want them, you know, polluting the city, so to speak. Little leaven living at the whole lump. So they'd get rid of the leaven. They'd say, whatever God wants you to do, you go do it and don't come back till it's done. All right? You're not going to disobey God around here, is what they would have said. So Jonah knows he can't stay. He knows that he can't keep doing what he used to do because... God doesn't want him to do it anymore. How are you going to preach unless God tells you what to preach? Oh, you can try, but people are going to know it's not preaching no more. That's opinions. Right, that's a pep talk. It's a little bit of chicken soup from behind the pulpit to help you through your week. Right, but it's not preaching. Jonah, I believe he didn't know, people would have known that he was faking it. So he knows there's only one option. He can't stay. So he got to go anyway. In the back of my mind, Brother Brian, if you know you got to leave, why not just leave where God wants you to go? But he'd go the opposite direction. He says, Arise and go to Nineveh. We know he goes to Tarshish. Boy, a ship headed that way. He never got there. But the exact opposite direction is what they tell me. I don't know. I've never seen both cities plotted on a map. And to be honest with you, good luck finding Nineveh nowadays. But that's a whole other story. Okay, but he says, I gotta go somewhere. So let's go the exact opposite direction. I know God said go to Nineveh. Granted, Jonah's a 
I believe if God calls you to preach, you're going to enjoy preaching, Brother Ron. I just, I just believe that's the way that it is. Don't believe you're going to get up and hate preaching every time that you preach. So Jonah, being a prophet, I do believe that he enjoyed prophesying, which is Old Testament speak for preaching. Okay, so knowing that God wanted him to go down to Nineveh, right? he may not have wanted to go to that city, but I believe that he'd enjoy being the mouthpiece of God because that's what God wanted him to do. He'd have found joy in God's calling on his life. So he knows he's running in the exact opposite direction. He's not going to be preaching no more. He knows he's going to be miserable. But yet he does it anyway. That I still can't wrap my head around how some people claim about that they're where God wants them to be. They're doing what God wants them to do. And yet they're miserable day in, day out. All they do is complain. All they do is murmur about what it is that God's got them doing. But I mean, if I get to do anything for the Lord, I'm excited about it. And the fact that He gives me anything to do, I'm satisfied in whatever He gives me to do. Why? Because that's the Lord. I'm the servant. He's the master. I'm the clay. He's the potter. But the fact that He wants me to do anything for His name, I'm head over heels. Well, here Jonah's got, I mean, it wasn't, you know, I feel like this is what God wants. Hogwash. If God wants you to do something, you're going to know it. Holy Ghost is going to burden your heart about it. But anyway, don't get me on that nonsense. Anyway, right, don't need to lay out a fleece. Right, don't need to pray for 14 days like that. If God wants you to do it, Holy Ghost is going to let you know. That's why Holy Ghost came. Right, that God would live in us as tabernacle. He gave us the word, lead us and guide us in all truth, lamp into our feet, light into our path. Right, the word is spiritually discerned, so he gave us his spirit so that we could... Dis anyway, you're going to know is the bottom line. But there's no doubt with Jonah. How do you know? Because the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Nobody told him. I think this is what God wants you... No, God told Jonah what God wanted him to do. But what happens now? That, well, if the Holy Ghost tells you to do it, guess what? God told you to do it. He's just as much a part of the Trinity as the Father or the Son. Right? Well, don't know how we got off on all that. But anyway. He says, Arise, go to Nineveh. Nineveh was popular. Not just because, well, it was infamous, I guess you could say. People knew about it. It had popularity. That's what I was looking for. He says that great city is a, is a sizable city. I did the math one time, read a bunch of different commentaries. They all gave me roughly. If Jonah preached from sun up to sundown, right? The Bible says that he preached from one side of the city to the other. If he preached from sun up to sundown, they tell me that it had taken him about three days to preach, walking across that city. That's how big the city was. Right now, I don't know if that was the short way or the long. I, don't, I doubt that the city was perfectly round. But I believe that he preached to everybody in that city. What are you saying? He did a lot of preaching once he got there. It's a big city. Right? But it was also infamous because of its lifestyle. Everybody knew Nineveh wicked. Nineveh's got false gods. None of us got a wicked law. Right? They don't live according to what does say the Lord. They live as according to what man says is right. What does that mean? It's all messed up. Right? You didn't have to know much about none of us to know don't go down there. They do things a whole lot different than we do around here. Jonah knew it wasn't a holy and righteous place. And especially he knew that it was getting real bad. Like, I don't understand how some people say, I want to go to Chicago. Why? Murder capital of the U.S. Right? They got the strictest gun laws. They got the most gun killings every year. Right? Especially downtown Chicago. I, I'm not going to watch the Chicago Bulls game. Not going to happen. Ever. Especially if they're playing at home. But there's just some places I'm not tempting fate. Now they tell me, 100 years ago, uh, pretty much the same because it's, you know, the bootleggers and everybody running. Al Capone down there. 
But, but at least them guys had a little bit of class. They kept it out of the streets most of the time. Right, they kept it in the business. What do you say? There was a time, I don't know when it was, wasn't 100 years ago. Had it been before that, but I bet you there's a time you could walk around downtown Chicago and feel safe. Right, but things have changed, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I dare say 1920, I wouldn't have felt too bad just walking down the street in Chicago. Because if I don't mess with nobody, chances are they're not going to mess with me. It's just the way things were back then. I'm not going to walk up and punch Al Capone in the face. I'd be dumb. Okay, I'd get cement shoes and chucked into a, one of the Great Lakes. Right, but everybody knows, eh, hey, Chicago, rough town. Well, Jonah heard that the rough town was getting so rough that God was about ready to send judgment. What's that mean? Nineveh got worse. But I heard not too long ago that the homeless situation out in California is so bad that they estimate with all these people living in these roaming homeless, you know, bands, caravans, I guess you could call it, that with all the untreated illnesses and everything going on, that there's a good chance that somebody down there already has a strain of the bubonic plague. That's what they called the Black Death. Right now, I just keep wondering, how can California get any worse? But yet they keep doing it. No offense, Schneckenbergers. But I'm not going to L.A. Not going to San Diego, San Francisco. Just not up my alley. Yeah, but what are you saying? I keep getting reports. I'm like, how, how can it get any worse for them people? Like they say that people are leaving Upper Cal in roves. Most of them moving to Texas because they've been tired of paying taxes so long. Texas don't have income tax. And they're like, let's go there. But what is it? Some places have got a reputation. I'm sure Jonah thought, well, how in the world could Nineveh have gotten any worse? It's bad before. But now it's so bad that God's threatening to wipe it off the face of the earth. And guess what he said in himself? I don't want to deal with that. I can see the thoughts going through his head. If I go down there and preach, they're going to kill me. Right, if I show up down there preaching the things that God wants me to preach, and when you get there, all they did was repent. Right, Jehovah God has said that if you don't repent, He's going to wipe everything off. You're not even going to be able to find where Nineveh used to be. Right, he said, look at what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Go find that. Can't. Like it's God's wrath was poured out on he said, God's judgment's about ready to be poured out on Nineveh. And you all know what happened. Taught them Gomorrah's cities of the plain. For that, they thought they had it pretty good. According to your King James Bible, the cities of the plain looked as if it were the garden of God when Lot looked at it. You know what that was? The garden of Eden. It looked fruitful. It looked healthy on the outside. But once you got inside, what was it? It was rotten, falling off the vine. He says, you think you got it good, but God says, right now, your wickedness is so great that judgment's coming. Get right or perish, is what he said. But before he went, I know what he's thinking. If I preach that, they're going to kill me. They're going to string me up. They're going to hang me in one of them temples that they have to one of their gods. He says, ready to kill me. May tar and feather me. I don't know what the Jonah's day and age was of making a spectacle out of somebody. But he's like, there's no telling what they're going to do. I can be that king's so wicked, as soon as he hears about it, he's going to have them, you know, run me over with chariots or something. He says, these people aren't going to care. They're going to want to keep on carrying on with their business. They're not going to pay any attention to me. I'm going to go all the way down there in Nineveh just to die. But how do you know what he's thinking? Because that's the same thing our flesh tells us in different degrees whenever God gives us something to do. Your flesh says, well, here's all the reasons you can't. Here's all the ways that it's not going to work. Here's all the ways that you aren't good enough or you aren't you know, proficient enough to go down there and make a difference. When really, us isn't the issue. God told Jonah to go. 
You know what that means? God knew Jonah could do it. Or else God wouldn't have told Jonah to go. God told Jonah to go down to Nineveh and preach against it. You know what that means? Jonah was just enough of a preacher that God sent him. If he couldn't have preached the message, that God wouldn't have sent him. If he didn't have the capability to do it, God wouldn't have called him to do it. God qualifies you, right, for his call. He doesn't give you all the training in the world just to sit there and do nothing. Right? God's not in. We, we hear this all the time from our pastor. It might have been a while since he said it. God's not interested in your ability. He's interested in your availability. Well, if you can't, but God asks you to do it, guess what that means? He's going to prepare you to do it before it's time for you to do it. Now, it may be as simple as somebody walking up and saying, hey, I'll go with you for a while. That Paul and Barnabas situation. If nobody else will go with you, I'll go with you. And we'll have a good time serving the Lord together while we do it. Right? Just someone along for the ride to give you a little bit of motivation, a little bit of encouragement. Maybe somebody that's been on a mission trip before just to say, hey, last time we did it this way, it worked best for us. God may tell you to do it a different way. All that matters is, is that we go. Right? More than one way to skin a cat. All that matters is that we do what God asks us to do. The way that he asked us to do it. Now Jonah had gone down there and started singing songs. Right? Like a minstrel. Trying to convince people with, you know, the modern day, his modern day version of the Aesop tables, or fables, right? Wouldn't have worked. Why? Because God told him to go down and preach. Jonah couldn't have gone down and had a heated debate with the king and changed his mind. Why? Because God told him to go down and preach. But as long as we do what God asks us to do, in faith, believing that he'll do what we can't do, guess what? He can use you. He said, go down and cry against the city for their wickedness. Well, what's your flesh? Well, those people aren't so bad. They're just misled. Yeah. Those people... Some of them don't even know any better. They were never taught the right way. True. The world is sinful because it was born in sin. The world is sinful because it doesn't know anything else. People that were born in sin, raised by a world that is cursed by sin, guess what? They're going to sin. But just because you can make an excuse for them doesn't mean that it's an excuse for you not to tell them the truth. Yeah, you're right. Most of the people in the city of Nineveh probably never were brought up to know about the God, right? Jehovah. The one that spoke and then everything that was came into existence. Right? In fact, you find when Jonah gets on that boat down to Tarshish, or Tarshish, however you want to say it, that he gets on the boat and they tell him, the sailors on that boat, first they cast lots, and of course, Jonah's trying to hide in the back. And he's like, nah, I don't want to play. And they're like, you have to play. Everybody's casting lots. He's like, fine, throw for me. Guess what? God just worked it out that his lot was the one that showed. Well, it's his fault that we're in this mess. Well, it was his fault that they were in that mess. But what were they doing? They were trying to, you know, use every little bit of voodoo and magic and everything else that they could conjure up. Whose fault is it? Well, God just said his And they come over and ask him. In fact, they said unto him, verse number 9, he said, I am an Hebrew, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and dry land. As soon as he said that, they got real cross. They said, oh, he didn't just like make Poseidon angry. Right? One of their made up gods. Oh, he didn't make Zeus angry. Oh no, they said, oh no, he made the big one mad. They said, we don't mess with that one. In fact, they it says that they prayed to God. Said, Lord, don't lay the innocent man's blood on our hands. He's the one that told us if we throw him off the boat, that you'd let us live. He says, we're just going to do what you said. Then afterwards, when the storm broke, you'll find that they're offering sacrifices up to God, and they all made vows towards God. 
Even when Jonah wasn't preaching, Jonah's life had enough. I am in Hebrew. They said, we know who his God is. We don't mess with him. He's a real deal. I believe them fellas got right. Don't know if they were Hebrew, but I believe that they made vows towards God that they'd serve and worship him for the rest of their life. Why? Because they're pretty serious because they lit a fire on a boat. Rule number one is sailing. No fire on boat. Fire on boat out at sea, bad. Why? Because to put the fire out, you got to put water in the boat. Guess what water in the boat does? Sink. So even those sailors knew when he showed up and said, I'm in Hebrew. The reason this is happening is because I fled from the face of the Lord. They said, you can't hang around us. If your God's that angry at you, you got to get gone. Guess what would have happened if Jonah stayed home? They just said, if you're running from God, you can't stay here. Everywhere that Jonah went, it had been cursed. Right, anybody remember the story? When Joshua took the Israelites across the river of Jordan, they go in, they march around the city of Jericho for six days, and seven times on the seventh day they marched around the city, blew the horns. Walls fell flat. Right, well, what happened? Well, there's one guy. He saw a Babylonian garment, wedge of silver, or wedge of gold and some silver. He took it and buried it under his floor. Guess what? Whole camp was cursed. Because the accursed thing was brought into the camp. The thing that God said not to do happened, and it affected everybody. Well, guess what would have happened if Jonah stayed at home or wherever he was in verse number one? His decision to not follow after God would have affected others. He knew that he wasn't going to do the will of God. He was already looking for a place to go. I believe he was trying to reason, where can I go and do the least amount of damage? That book, you can't not be right with God and not have a negative impact on other people. If you're wrong with God, guess what? Your life's wrong. Fact. Let's see. I think it's the word, yeah, it's vexed. The definition of the word vexed is that it, it's as if, if we were to make your heart metaphorical, it's not really shaped like that, but let's pretend it is. To be vexed means it feels like somebody's on the inside tearing you apart with hooks, separating you into two different things. But very apt description. If you're vexed, you're torn in two directions, but it's tearing you apart being in the middle of those two directions. That being pulled in two directions isn't a problem if uh, that's Charlie and Joseph tied a rope to each one of my arms and tried to pull me in. It wouldn't be a big problem. I could pick them up probably by the ropes. Right? But if Peter and Charlie did it, might be in a, might be in a spot. Right? That might do some damage. What do you say? There are some cares in this life that you've learned to Master, you've reigned in your flesh, not bothering you. But they, you may feel that the rope got put up and they're yanking, but you can just drag them with you. You can compel your flesh to go. You can do the will of God without those things affecting you. But here at Jonah, whatever it was, on the, he was torn to do what God wanted him to do because he knew it was the right thing. But whatever it was that kept him either in fear or hatred. Later we find out that he gets angry that God even sent revival. Don't know if he might have been a little racist towards the Ninevites. I don't know. He may have just had, maybe he had a bad experience one time. Where because maybe on his father's business he went down to Nineveh and they treated him wrongly. Maybe he was robbed. Maybe he tried to go to the judge and say, Judge, that man robbed me. And he said, Well, where's the proof? Right? They pulled the wool over everybody's eyes, maybe paid some people off. Right? Jonah goes home without anything. What are you saying? Could have happened. I don't know. But he had some reason, whether it was justified or unjustified, that he hated Nineveh. And he decided he wasn't going to go. He hated the idea of going down there and preaching. He hated the idea that God even wanted to save the city. What are you saying? Whatever it was that was pulling this way, it was tearing Jonah apart. 
And he said, if it's going to tear me apart and destroy me, he said, I'm going to go someplace where nobody knows me, where I can be miserable on my own. But little did he know, if he didn't go, God being God probably would have found somebody else to go. But if he didn't go, Nineveh is still wicked. Nineveh is still going to suffer judgment. He was willing to have all them people's blood on his hands just because he didn't want to go. He was real set on being out of the will of God. So with what little time we got left, this whole thing, these two verses. The will of God for your life, nine times out of ten, very simple. You want to know when it's not simple? When we make it complicated. How simple is Jonah? Get up, go down to Nineveh, preach against their wickedness, because their wickedness has come up before me. All he had to do is get up and go. Don't know how long it had taken him to get to Nineveh, but once he got there, it could have been about three days that he went from one side of the city to the other. Then after he got done preaching from one side of the city to the other, I don't find where Jonah went up to the king and said, what must we do in order to get right with the Almighty? They knew what they had. The king rent his clothes, put on sackcloth. They all repented. They knew what to do. Jonah just could have gone, preached, and then come back home. Didn't say that God told him to stay there. Didn't say that God told him to get up and move down there. He says, no, rise, go down to Nineveh, preach to him. Because the wickedness come up before me. That's real simple. In fact, I don't think that you can read that any way wrong. Right? It's not like you can read that and then think, oh, well, God wants me to go to Tarshish. No. God said, get up, get down to Nineveh, and get to preaching. Real simple. But what's the will of God for your life? I promise you this. Pretty simple. Do you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to be holy as he is holy. That's the general call. He said, you're a new creature. That new creature is supposed to look like my son. My son's holy. You be holy. Everything he was, you be it. In fact, that's where the name Christian came from. Because those down in Antioch lived and looked so much like Christ that guess what? They start calling them Christ-like. That's the will of God. But what about the personal call? Personal will of God for your life. Well, I know he wants you to be a part of a church. I know he wants you to be involved in that church. Yeah, those are general things. But what's God, what's God got for you? God didn't tell this to anybody else but Jonah. How do you know? Because there wasn't another preacher down there when Jonah got there. What's the thing that God wants you to do? But just you. you may run from it. Maybe planning to run from it. Maybe arguing. Well, Lord, if I go down there, they're going to tear me apart. Well, Lord, if I do that, I won't make it out the other side. If I do that, Lord, it'll ruin all of these plans that I had. Lord, if I do that, I got to get up out of my comfort zone. Arise. Go. I'm going to have to let loose of them things that I've gotten comfortable with. And Lord, to be honest with you, I don't feel like walking all the way to Nineveh. He didn't tell him to walk. I know there was water close to Nineveh. Well, how do you know that? Because a giant fish spit him out on the dirt and then he got to Nineveh from there somewhere. What's that? It, it was somewhere next to water. Well, he's not, Jonah could have gotten there however he wanted to. God had to send him via the way of a fish because he got on a boat. But could have taken a chariot, could have walked, could have rode a camel. God didn't specify. He just said, Go. So what's God want you to do? And then why don't we do it? Do we blame it on other people? Lord, they're too wicked. Lord, you don't know what they did to me. Lord, you don't know how they treated me that one time. You don't know how much they, they hate me so much that they won't listen to what I have to say. But I believe that as soon as none of us all, one of God's men walking through the gate... They started picking at him, shouting, booing, but eventually 
the preaching got a hold of them and they said, oh, he's serious. He's not here preaching that we got to repent because we're so, he said, he's here to preach that if we don't repent, destruction. Well, I can promise you this, there's one thing that's sure and that's death. Well, guess what? Those that die without them, destruction. Everlasting torment. Thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Right? Double dead. Double destruction. We say, Brother Jordan, more, just as serious as it. So why don't we go out and do what God wants us to do? Because you know why He wants us to go? Because there's people out there that are facing destruction. Everlasting destruction. And He wants to send you to be the voice of, hey, there's a better way. Jonah had to preach damnation. You know what we get to preach? Christ. Hallelujah. Right, we get the good news, the gospel, to go and take. It's no more God's going to judge you and destroy you. God wants to redeem you. But why don't we go? I know Jonah didn't want to go so bad, he went in the exact opposite direction. But he's like, wish I could have told you I've never done that. Guess what? I did that. Guess what happened? It wasn't a big fish, but I got run over by something. And eventually found my way back home. Well, he's like, it's dumb. In fact, it makes absolutely no sense to the new creature. Oh, what's the new creature want to do? The will of the Father. What's the old man want to do? Anything but. He says, rise, go down to Nineveh and cry against the city. I'm sure that Jonah much rather would have set up a little tent on the outside of the city with a sign that says, God's going to destroy you if you want to know how to avoid it. Come out and see me. Right? Put up a big old equivalent of that day of a billboard. God's going to destroy it. But no, he had to go into it. He said, cry against the city. What's that mean? All of them. Go preach to all of them. Go cry out that God right, is sending judgment. You know what cry implies? That everybody heard it. Nobody could have missed it. What's that mean? He must have had a very strong throat. Or God worked it out to where everybody was just situated to where they heard what he was preaching. But to cry, again, that means he had to go to each one of them. Some of us are fine with what God's asked us to do, just not the way that God asked us to do it. Well, okay, Lord, I'll go down to Nineveh, but I'm not going that's a wicked place. I'm not going in there. Jesus was the friend of publicans and sinners. What did he do? He went down to where they were. How about you get off your high horse and remember where God found you and go grab somebody from the same place? Jonah's saying, Lord, that place is defiled, it's wicked. Yeah. But if you don't go in, they're not going to hear. If you put up a big old sign on the outskirts of town, how many people never left the city? How many people were just down alleyways and, you know, had shacks in the corner? Of the, they never got out of the city. What would they have done? How many of them couldn't read? He says, no, go down and cry. Lord, how about I write the king a letter? No, go down there and preach to every single one of them. Well, what if I take a few guys with me and we go down there and we divvy it up? He says, no, you go preach. God's very simple. Go down there, cry against the city. Who made it complicated, Jonah? Lord, I don't want to go down there and preach. Or I'll go down there and preach, but we're going to do it my way. He said, no, you're going to go down and cry against the city. What's that mean? Preach so everybody hears you. Real simple. But yet we can make it so complicated. Lord, what do you want me to do? I want to teach Sunday school class. Lord, I never taught Sunday school class before. So before I can teach Sunday school class, i got to go learn some stuff. He says, just get up and teach. Right? Teach what God's done for you. 
Lord, there are people in the room, they've been saved longer and I've been preaching, been alive. How in the world am I going to teach them? Just get up and teach the Word. You say, what's this conversation, Brother Jordan? That's the conversation I had with God when he, the pastor came and said, hey, you want to teach the adult Sunday school? I don't know. I know nothing about teaching. Guess what? Still don't know really what we're doing up here. What we're doing. We're doing what God tells us to do. That's about it. What you say? There's a whole lot of conversations you can have on, well, don't I need to go do this first? No. Not if God didn't tell you to do it. Don't I need to take this person with me? Not unless God told you to bring them. Well, I saw somebody else do it this way. Well, God may have told them to do it that way, but if God didn't tell you to do it that way, don't do it that way. Real simple. God said, He told him exactly what he needed to do. Go and cry against the city. You know what the point I'm trying to get to? At the end of verse number 2, Jonah knew exactly what God wanted him to do. No doubt. No, no misinterpretations. Right down to the jot and tittle. To the finest details, Jonah knew exactly what God wanted him to do. Because this verse may not mean anything to you on those instructions. But guess what? Jonah understood every word just the way that God wanted him to understand it. Because when God tells you to do something for him, you know exactly what he wants you to do. Because he tells you how to do it in a way that you understand it. If God tells you, right, lays it on your heart, that, let's make up something, that He wants you to repaint the entire city, don't, nobody touch the paint. Okay, paint's fine. You touch the paint, it's not going to match the carpet and everything else anymore. You're going to get in trouble, and I don't want it to be my fault because I use this as an example. Okay, so nobody touch the paint. Okay, but, let's say it would. God wants to repaint the same. Well, I volunteered paint. Right? If God really put it on your heart to paint, you know exactly the standard that God set for you. You know how God expects it to be done. And you know how much of your ability you're going to have to use to do it, which usually is all of it. Right? You can go around here and look. Guess what God's standard is? Best. So if you know you paint... You know that you can't just splash it on the baseboards. I know you got to take care. You got to cut everything in first. Hey, you, certainly, if you're going to be using a sprayer, you're going to have to cover everything else. That, oh, that'll be easy. We'll just get it straight. Well, you think that until you realize you got to make sure the paint don't get on anything except the wall because God told you to paint the wall. God didn't tell you paint floor and paint, paint ceiling. He told you paint wall. You knew that God wanted you to paint wall. And you knew that God expected paint wouldn't be anywhere else but the wall. Well, you say, when God gives, it could be something as simple as, well, we probably need to change the light bulbs around the church. So let's get the best and the brightest, Brother Ray, so that everybody go blind. But no, you want to know what happened? You want to know why all of them got changed? Because he knew if they only replaced one, it'd look funky. Well, why is that one brighter than that one? Just nip it in the bud. Replace all of them. And, in theory, they'll all burn out at around the same time too. Because they're all on together. What are you saying? God gives you something to do. He's going to give you enough common sense to do it too. So if you know what God expects you to do, why would we ever try anything less? You know, if Nineveh went down there and preached to half the city... It may not have been a fish, but he'd have had to deal with God's judgment again. All right, Lord, I'll go down and I'll preach. But I'm only preaching to the middle of the city and then walking out the same way that I came. Guess what would have happened? may not have been a fish. may have been a giant sand snake or something. He had to spend a little bit of time. In. All right, Lord, I'll go back down there and preach to the other half of the city. What do you say? Jonah knew God's expectations as soon as God got done talking to him. When it comes to the will of God in your life, you know what God's expectations are. They're Christ. Your best. Unreserved. Given to God with 
what a resentful, penitent, right? Cowering in fear before God. No, God loves the cheerful giver. You say, well, I may not have much to give to God. Well, if you give all you've got, we ain't talking about this. We're talking about this. You give everything you've got cheerfully. Lord, I'm just happy to do something for you. Guess what? You give just as much as anybody that had much to give and gave all that they had. Because all is all. Your all is just as much as anybody else's all. Doesn't matter how little you think it is in your eyes. And if God asks you to do it, guess what? If you give your all for what God said, you're in this magic little place. It's called the perfect will of God. You know what that means? You are down to the nanometer, exactly where God wants you to be. Living the way that God wants you to live. You're not in this place called the permissible will of God. That's where most people live. Well, God, I know you want me to do this, and I'll get around to it later. Or God, I'm not living in sin, and I'm doing my best to... They say they're doing their best to do what you want me to do, but all these things have just come up and said, what's that? They're in this place where they're not suffering God's judgment and chastisement yet, but they also know that they need to be closer to the things of God. What's that? That's a place where you're miserable. Out here, past the permissible will of God, right? You're under judgment. That's more than miserable. That's God breaking everything down in your life to the point where you got nothing left but Him so that you come back to God. Because if you're that stubborn, He'll go that far to prove to you that He was right and you were wrong. What are we saying? All is all. Perfect will of God. Guess what? That's where you have fellowship with God. That's where you know that God... You know where Jonah was in chapter number 1? Or verse number 1? I believe he's in the perfect will of God. And in a heartbeat, it changed when he said, God wants me to go down there and I'm not going. It didn't matter where he went, guess where he was? Not in the will of God. Do you think that not being in the will of God just affects you? It, it, he knew it would affect everybody in that town. So he went and got on a boat. He didn't think it would affect all of them sailors. But he found out that it did. And for three days and three nights in the belly of that great fish, guess what he learned? He could either do it God's way or his life and everybody else's life was going to be miserable. God prepared that fish for Jonah. You know what I think that means? I believe that that fish could have held on to Jonah as long as God wanted him to. Till it took Jonah to realize, all right, Lord, I'll do it. That fish was made to teach Jonah a lesson. I don't want to find out what fish God's got out there for me. But I know that if I stray too far, I'll find out. I'd rather just be in the perfect will of God. You see, the will of God is not a joke. It's not a laughing matter. It's not something that we just talk about in passing. No, it's life or death. If you're in the perfect will of God, you know what that means? You're going to help save some of them out there that were destined to be destroyed. Guess what? They're going to get right. How do you know that? Because that's the perfect will of God for your life, that we go to the lost and dying world. Now, I believe that he wouldn't send us if nobody was going to get right. I believe we'd be raptured out of here already. You know what that means? If we keep going, somebody's going to get in. Because if everybody was already in, we'd be gone. But if we're out of the will of God, guess what? Their life may be required in my hands. Stand before God, I didn't go, Lord, and because of that, they died and went to hell. They'll be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Why? Because I didn't want to? Because it messed up my plan? Or because it wasn't convenient to my flesh? I've got the wrong perspective. It's either we're in or we're out. And if we're out, God's going to do everything that it takes to get us back in. Because He's our Father. He knows how to chase us in order to get us back in. But far more important than that, that if we're not in, we're a stumbling block that people will fall over and die, trip all their way into hell because we weren't 
committed enough, didn't love the Lord enough, didn't have enough faith in God that He could use us to do something for Him. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.